Hey, this is Josh Modell, host of the Talk House Podcast. Since we're heading toward the end of the year, this week we're going to resurface a great episode instead of bringing you a brand new one. In this case, it's one of my favorites that we ran in 2023 with a conversation between Jermaine Clement, best known as half of Flight of the Concords, and Ruben Nielsen of Unknown Mortal Orchestra. They're both from New Zealand, big fans of each other's work, and have great stories. Enjoy. Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey, Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Call Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On this week's episode, we've got a pair of New Zealanders who forged incredible careers in music and comedy and comedic music, Jermaine Clement and Ruben Nielsen. Now, I'm guessing Clement is best known to our listeners as half of Flight of the Concords, his musical and acting duo with Brett McKenzie. They haven't put out a record or toured much in the last decade or so, but their albums and HBO series definitely endure with subtle hilarity. Clement has, of course, been plenty busy post-Concords as both an actor and director, His 2014 mockumentary, What We Do in the Shadows, co-directed with his old friend Taika Waititi, spun off into one of the funniest shows on TV. And you've also heard or seen him in everything from Despicable Me to the latest Avatar movie. In the awful event that you're not familiar with Flight of the Concords, here's a little bit of their David Bowie tribute, simply called Bowie, which is discussed a bit in this episode. This is Bowie to Bowie. Do you hear me out there, man? Now, Clement seemed excited and well-prepared to speak with Ruben Nielsen, the singer-guitarist behind Unknown Mortal Orchestra. Though both of these guys are, as I said, from New Zealand and fans of each other's work, they had never met before. UMO, as Nielsen's band is known for short, has been making a sort of uncategorizable music since about 2010. They most often get pegged as psychedelic rock, which isn't wrong, but also doesn't tell the whole story. There are also elements of lo-fi indie rock, a bit of funk, and some garage rock. But the fact that it's tough to name is part of what makes UMO's music so appealing. Check out a little bit of their song, The Garden, which opens the latest UMO album, V. These guys have a fantastic conversation that spans everything from the history of New Zealand and their shared Maori heritage to an in-depth examination of the Jagstang, a guitar designed by Kurt Cobain and favored by Nielsen. They talk about bombing on stage and getting bombed before going on stage. And they share stories about coming up in a shared place. Also, you'll hear the phrase, sad, funky ghost, perhaps for the first and last time in your life. Enjoy. Hi, Jermaine. <laughs> I feel like I won a competition or something to uh, meet you and talk to you. The first that uh, first time I'd ever heard something you've made was on BFM, and it was the um, Lord of the Rings song. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I just remember this line from that. It's like, I don't rap about... I don't rap, I don't rap about... Bit- bitches and holes. I rap about riches and trolls. <laughs> uh, but I was thinking that's way before the album came out. It was after the first trailer came out, at least. We played it on TV, I think, in a live thing, maybe, and um, someone thought it would be a good idea to try and release it. So we hadn't recorded anything before, and we did go and record that with the idea that it would somehow be a hit off the back of the Lord of the Rings franchise. (laughs) (laughs) We didn't quite get that together. One time we had to play that in front of the cast. They were still filming here in Wellington and we had to, you know, I had to be Ian McKellen in front of Ian McKellen and we were making these really uh, quite insulting impressions of them in, in front of them. But one really cool thing we did get to see is Andy Circus was there and he asked if he could get up after us and he he did a rap battle between Smeagol and Gollum and uh, we didn't record it, we should have. Uh, wow. we, we were discussing, should we record this? No, we felt too naughty. I feel like I hear your music every day somewhere. When I go into town, it, it's playing somewhere in any city in the world. <laughs> I'm always glad to hear it. <laughs> oh, it's nice. And I'm really loving this album. I've been listening to it a lot, especially this one song, I Killed Captain Cook. <laughs> 
which is uh, very interesting. It's a very beautiful song, melodically, it's, uh, just acoustic guitar, which is quite unusual in amongst the rest of the album. Can you tell me about that song? <laughs> it's funny because it's hard to convey to people outside of New Zealand how like ubiquitous Captain Cook is. Like everything's named after him and the history and everything. Yeah, a lot of hotels he used to be on our money even when um, I, I was a kid for sure. He used to be in the watermark. You hold it up to the light, you'd see the ghost of Captain Cook. <laughs> My mum had this thing where she was, she used to always talk about how like Hawaiians killed Captain Cook and like she was always like really proud of that and thought it was really funny and all this stuff, which was like really different. Her attitude. In New Zealand, he's talked about as um, rather insultingly that, you know, you and I both uh, have Māori parents. Um, he's talked about as the discoverer of New Zealand. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, um, yeah. He's the Columbus of the South Seas, right? And also whatever is how we try to yeah. explain it to people here. And our parents' response, I'm sure, is like, we was discovered 800 years before he even got here. But yeah, he's a, he's a controversial figure, I suppose, and um, but not to the deg- degree of Christopher Columbus. Which, but um, the Hawaiian story is pretty interesting, right? Because he, uh, and I didn't know this until recently, that he um, he was killed because he kidnapped a chief yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah, I guess that kicked everything off. The thing for me was always just like trying to write a kind of Hawaiian song and then sort of um, trying to write something to amuse my mum, really, I think. And then, and then, like, like, because I don't have any, like, really, like, visceral anger or anything around <laughs> that mm. around him particularly, because he was like in Polynesia for a long time, and so he had times when he was really, um, in you know, in good faith, like, interacting with Polynesian culture, and other times when he was just more of a colonizer. But I think later on in his life, he was like became more cynical and kind of maybe just like tired and like sick of <laughs> going to the islands or something. So I just kind of thought it would be a song that my mom would like because it was about one of these the subject that she would always like light up about. We don't hear much about that part of Captain's Cook, or we didn't used to have that about his life or his, his death. We didn't hear about it much. Sometimes you'd hear the Hawaiians killed him. Yeah. That <laughs> you didn't know what their story is, and there is an interesting story. It's hard to know what a Hawaii or New Zealand would be like without the influence of Captain Cook, but you can still have empathy for your ancestors and ancestors are a very important part in all Polynesian culture. You know, there's a sense that they're watching over you. If you dream about, you know, I think everyone in our families dreamt about, you know, ancient Maori people watching them at some point. And I once had this dream, um, it was in this little town called Eureka and there was a terrible uh, massacre there of Indian people where the settlers had uh, killed a lot of women and children while the men were hunting. And um, I had this dream that I was in the town and the uh, and the Indian people were coming to to get revenge. And I was like, oh, no, no, I'm not one of them. I just happened to be here. <laughs> their, their weapons weren't weapons. They were like uh, gardening tools and things like that. And I'm like, oh, they're not attacking. And then I looked again and they weren't, they weren't Native American. They were Maori people. And I was like, oh, it's a similar yeah, so yeah, it's a confusing <laughs> dream, but um, I'm safe. <laughs> yeah, I'm safe. But yeah, that song, you know, it has a really beautiful but scary imagery. You use the word visceral, it's, you know, very, you know, it's violent and pretty. Uh, it's a really interesting song. Thank you. The Hawaiian culture and the Maori culture are very similar but very different. And, and you've grown up in those two. Did you go through your life looking at those similarities and differences? Yeah, probably one of the main, like, themes, you know, growing up was, like, trying to figure out, like, how to translate, like, Hawaiian-ness and uh, Pākehā-ness and <laughs> this idea that, like, you know, like my cousins, you know, would, I talked to my cousins and, like, they would be really similar, that they have American accents and stuff like that. And then... And then they, I think, had the same thing with this, like, oh, you're into all the same stuff as me, but we talk like Crocodile Dundee or whatever. <laughs> so that was yeah. always like a, a weird thing. But it's also, you know, having like Pakia family and stuff like that, that was also like a big contrast, which I think really like influenced, I guess, like aesthetics or like thing. I feel like a lot of the times growing up, I don't know if you felt this way, but like you would, um, 
you know, it'd be like camps, there's like segregation. And if you're kind of like more mixed, it's like you don't really see this kind of boundary where like Polynesian culture starts. And That's right. Yeah, I do feel like that. Yeah. I feel like it's a good thing for a creative person. There's um, not as many differences as people think is how I felt. That's true as well. And then like also I just think it's quite healthy when you're doing something creative to already have this like, I guess, my kind of porous view of culture. I'm three quarters Pakeha, but I don't know my Pakeha family. I never met them, you know. Uh, really the whole family? But I know that I look Pakeha <laughs> uh, to most people. Yeah. <laughs> but the um the uh oh and for those of you who don't know, the Pakeha is basically white, uh yeah. European. Um this, the Maori word for it. Your music's like mixed race as well. <laughs> it's like uh, you know, there's it's got big funk influences, but I wouldn't say it's funk. And I always read it's psychedelic whenever it's described as psychedelic. And I wouldn't have thought it. You know, I wouldn't have described it like that. Would you call your music psychedelic? I think it's like I started out being really interested in like '60s music, which I suppose like psychedelia was a big mm-hmm. part of that. Like like london the london scene and like laurel canyon and, and all that kind of stuff like what what bands and musicians were your influences there the things i keep coming back to would be like love you know, like arthur lee mm-hmm. and yeah. sly stone zappa um I, it's interesting i'm reading a book at the moment which is like a bunch of conspiracy theories around laurel canyon and there's like all these heroes of mine that's like families with military backgrounds and all that kind of stuff and i it kind of um it's really interesting because it's kind of like, you know, a, a level of depth, like getting kind of deeper into the kind of knowledge or whatever. But some part of me just wants to be an innocent fan. Like I was thinking about how much of that is in Flight of the Concords too. Like um, the Bowie song is just like, um, I always really loved the Bowie song because it just is like unbridled, like, Bowie, I just like Bowie love. You know? Yeah, we're not making fun of him exactly. We're just trying to be like him. You're making fun of like how you kind of pick up a bunch of things that you think Bowie's about without like getting too caught up in the like the seriousness of it. I don't know if it's a New Zealand thing or what, but it's a sort of like a naivety, like where I just sometimes just want to enjoy things, like get trapped in the my first impressions of them. Like the first kind of early idea of like Sly Stone. When I'd see pictures of the band or videos of the band that I'd think I want to be in that band. Yeah. 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 That looks like yeah, it looks like a fun time and and what a great sound to be part of. Yeah, and just so much positivity. And then they were also, you know, I remember, you know, part of the whatever discourse or whatever around them when you would see them on TV or in documentaries or whatever was always that they were, it was like mixed gender, mixed race band. And it was like proof of concept of like a bunch of people all getting along. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You know, like a little microcosm of society. Because um, that happens in music all the time where you influence, you know, different musicians like hip hop's influenced by classical music and pop music influenced by blues and you know all these things happen but they did it like they did it on stage you know where they they put all these things together i still really love that and i think it's i don't know it's pretty funny because of the way how dark the world seems to be getting but like i still kind of like that cheesiness like it's like not it's definitely not fashionable to be so I feel like music was kind of this thing where people would just be like, <laughs> you'd just be able to say, like, can we all just get along and then get down? And then everybody would have a party <laughs> yeah. and then roll credits. But like, yeah, well, the music is the place where that does happen. You don't even need to speak the same language as someone to be able to play with them, to jam with them. Yeah. I used to have a flat in Wellington and uh, we used to play really loudly bass, guitar, drums in this. We used to live across the road from this fish factory. Yeah. And um, it was really loud. They, but they would still complain about our noise. Yeah. But they, they would have tracks out there at six in the morning. And then one day, <laughs> there's this knock on this door. This guy in white overalls, like my dad used to wear at the freezing works, <laughs> um, and holding these drumsticks. And he's like, boy, couldn't I play? And he's like, he's Russian. <laughs> His name was Andre. And we played with him for like three hours after work. And he'd, 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 he'd really broken English. But he's like, 
I like to play rock and roll. <laughs> and then we just <laughs> played with him and he was great. He hadn't played for 20 years, but he had been oh. hearing us and wanting to ask if, if he can play. And uh, yeah, so he just came with his sticks and his few things he could say. And we didn't need to really communicate with words. And the music's in one place. Yeah, that's really, really beautiful. <laughs> it was great. He never came around again. <laughs> he probably thought those guys were shit. <laughs> I don't want to forget to say this, but when... Me and Cody and Paul first moved to the States was when the Play the Concords TV show was out. And the um it was so weird because it was like getting started in Portland and what the show was about was like almost like it's like a little guide or we kind of kept like paralleling with stuff that was happening to us like because you know it's basically a TV show about these Kiwi guys like trying to negotiate America. We also, yeah, we also influence how people see New Zealanders. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people used to thank us New Zealanders living in America, saying no one could understand my accent until that show came on. Yeah, that makes sense. Like we go, like literally go to some cafe and do a gig, and then there would be an episode that would come out about yeah. you guys going to a cafe and having a really awkward gig. It was really helpful in a way. Like I think it would have been a lot more lonely, like trying to figure out America. And I still, I still feel like that's a weird thing, like trying to like uh, convert your sense of humor into, uh, you know, translate it into Americans. I lived in LA and um, in New York, and you know, people understand ninety-seven percent of what you mean. <laughs> it's just that three yeah. percent was that lonely area that you're talking about, where oh, no one understands this part of my mind. Yeah. Unless I find an Australian or New Zealander. When I was trying to think why your music's called Psychedelic, I looked up your gear board, your uh, <laughs> equip board page. Yeah. And that's, if you don't know, yeah. the listener, the, the one listener that we have on this podcast. Uh, it's a page that tells you music, musicians and all the gear that's been recorded that they use. And um, I noticed you use a Jagstang guitar, a Fender Jagstang, yeah. which is quite unusual because it's a hybrid of two different guitars and it was invented by Kurt Cobain. Yeah. And do you know how he invented it? I think he took a picture of a Jaguar and a picture of a Mustang and cut an, I mean, uh, yeah, Jaguar and yeah. Mustang and cut them and sent it to Fender. Yeah, that's right. He, and he gave it to Fender and said, make me this. This is my perfect guitar. And I don't feel like I see them played very often. But is yours a 90s one or is it in one of the new ones? It's a 90s one, but the way that I got the, into the Jagstang was that I had a friend at, because I went to Elam Art School in Auckland, and uh, I had a friend there, and he always had this, he kind of messed around on the guitar. This is a lo- kind of a long-winded story, but his dad was uh, a monk. I'm really, I'm th- listening. I'm here, think, me and the listener. <laughs> I think the whole thing was his dad wanted him to be a monk, and he was monkeying around in New Zealand studying painting and playing this Jagstang. And then his dad got sick and he went back to Japan to, I think, pretend he was going to be a monk so that his dad would die being like, oh, good, he's, happy, he's given happy it up. Thinking, my, yeah. yeah. And there was this girl that we knew and he gave her the guitar and said, keep this for ages and then give it to Ruben. <laughs> and so she didn't know how long he meant. But, you know, I was in this other band called The Mint Shakes, a punk band. And yeah. at some point, she just, like, came to one of the gigs and said, oh, Korsky said, keep this for ages and then give it to you. And then so I, years after we went back to Japan, I got this guitar. And then and then I was like, oh, I suppose I better learn how to use it. But the weird thing was is that guitar changed my whole style. Like, the way that I played it, it was like, I suppose that's where the psychedelic thing came from because I didn't really want to play punk music on it. Why is that? What because uh, yeah, the music that you play in the um, Mint Chicks is it's very technically very different, right? It's like it's all downstrokes on the car, you know, rock yeah. chords. Yeah, it's almost the opposite of uh, opposite approach to the guitar. I had a Telecaster and I would just bash on it really, and it was pretty indestructible, so you could do it. But the Jagstang is quite delicate instruments. 
So I had to play it totally differently, but it kind of gave birth to a whole new band, really. So it's like one of the things about the Jags thing is it's got this really dodgy neck. Like you can kind of bend the the whole guitar so it's kind of twists. Well, that's because it was designed from two Polaroids. And like uh, the other thing is Kurt Cobain didn't like the guitar. Like he got it and he was like, oh, cool. And he would just have it and they would send him the. And I think if he broke a string and he just had nothing else to play, he might like play it. And he just like hardly ever played it. It was like he didn't mm. like it. But I actually think it's um, it's my favorite Fender guitar. It's just like the whole neck is just kind of wobbly. Yeah. The whole, the neck itself. So you can kind of twist and turn the neck. And that, I really like that. So that was cool. And then the other thing is like the Jack Stang is really light. And so we made this guitar that's like five pounds. And so I can kind of like hold the guitar out like this. And you've got a really unique way of holding the guitar. Because when I looked at the photos of you, I tried it, which is you have it on what I would call the wrong shoulder, the strap. Yeah. yeah. You, you put it on, you put it on your strumming shoulder. People usually put it over their fretting shoulder. Yeah. And, yeah. You, re- and you hold it higher than anyone I've seen except maybe a classical player who has their knee up. So where did that come from, holding a guitar like that? I think I got it from John Dwyer from the OCs. Yeah. He's got the guitar way up here. So for a while, I actually held it way up like that. And then over the years, it just I think it was just because my strap just like stretched and I was too lazy to like ratchet it back up again. Does that help your fingering that you're doing? having it that height yeah i mean it's it is nice it's often often uh, rock players heavy metal players play hold it really low because it looks yeah chris novoselic or like jimmy page wear the guitar super low so when i was a kid that was like the cool way to wear the guitar that's right a lot of stuff i do is i think is like trolling or like being contrarian or like you know just doing everything wrong like even the way that UMO is, I think it's a lot of it was to do with reacting against the punk scene in New Zealand and just like these kind of rules about what was cool and what isn't and trying to do everything wrong, like guitar solos. You don't do those. Yeah, it was like really punk. off. Yeah, it was like against the rules or something. Yeah, I remember seeing in an interview with one of the um, guitarists from um, the Sex Pistols talking about when the other guitarist turned up and saying you would try and teach him sevenths, try and teach him Beatles chords. Oh, yeah. And say, no, we're not doing that. It's like, that's one of the rules. Yeah. <laughs> You're not doing these yeah, yeah. funny chords. Yeah. And so punk is, I think, it's a reaction against stuff. But then I also thought that it was really funny to kind of piss off the old punks as well, like the people that we really looked up to. When I was a kid, I used to listen to Public Image Limited, and they were always like, to me, they seemed like they were always really trolling people a lot and like trying to do things that would be confusing or whatever and i just think it's just fun i think to like take that out into the public you know but most people who are watching you don't know that right it's pretty subtle i feel weird talking to you about it because um you know this (laughs) because you because you're like i don't know because you've made me laugh so much like your proper comedian and then like i feel like what i think of as humor in my music is so it's not funny. Sometimes the best humor to me is when it, only you find it funny. <laughs> like, oh, this one's just for me. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> even when we're writing comedy, you know, you go, when you write for a play or a, or a song or whatever, there's some, you know, that people probably aren't going to laugh at, but you laugh. So it makes it interesting for you. I think it's sort of part of that thing, right? You're going to have got to get from, like, at a live show, you have to get from the beginning of the show to the end of the show. So it's like, important that the performance or whatever be worth people's time or have some value but you still have you can't be standing up there bored going through the motions it might be six months or a year or two years or whatever of touring and so you know these things these little in jokes between you and other musicians or or jokes that you have with yourself or ways that you have with coping uh, coping with the material or whatever yourself is actually really important even though yeah you know it's not for the benefit of other people yeah you don't want to robotically recreate the same show every every night but the audience also they want some consistency as well as some interest you know and you've got to find a balance of you know do they want it to sound exactly like the album and uh, i think nowadays people don't yeah we want it to sound exactly like the album like people used to we're like anti-backing track like we've never used backing tracks i'm often disappointed when a band has the bass on a backing track or you know things like that it's always disappointing to see an apple logo 
on a, <laughs> on a yeah. stage to me. We didn't grow up with any money, so I also feel really um, like I don't want to take my nice laptop on stage because, like, that's where booze is being spilled and people like run on stage and I, maybe it's because we used to have a lot more chaotic shows back in the old days but like i could never imagine it was okay with your telecaster but with your delicate <laughs> yeah. guesting you, yeah. you've got to be you got to be careful yeah and i hate the idea of having an expensive piece of like digital equipment that breaks down or it crashes or something halfway through a song or yeah it's terrifying yeah i've got a powered pedal board and it sometimes gives up it sometimes just gives up an hour in. I've never taken it on stage, but it's <laughs> so worrying. I've mentioned it to other musicians even, and it's like, oh, that would be the worst. Yeah, you know, even a pedal that has, like, too many knobs on it is too complicated for me Yeah, when I'm on stage. And I also have this kind of thing where I started to realize, like, I want to be able to be too drunk and still put on a good show. So anything that's too um delicate <laughs> or involves too too much um concentration you don't want to lean down and be fiddly with knobs no while no. you're drunk if i need to turn a knob i want to be able to just twist it with my foot also you know really yeah really dumb stuff like that it's like it, that's when i feel like i have my dream job you know well yeah i mean often though you know people you like when you look at their um equipment like that uh, mick ronson david bowie's guitarist he has two pedals i think or one pedal yeah <laughs> you know you know and it's just it leaves it in the same place and it sounds great i did some homework because <laughs> i realized that you know somebody was asking me did you name because i have a song called um nadia on the new record and then people were asking me if it was named after the character from um what we do in the shadows oh they do in the shadows and I realize I don't have any other reference for that name. Oh, yeah. So it's the same spelling with a J. I think you got the name from a movie from the 90s. Yeah. So I watched that movie and it was really, really sick. I thought it was an amazing movie. Yeah. It was like produced by David Lynch, I think. I remember seeing it in the next day, just saying to uh, Taika, we've got to do some vampire thing. That's really cool. <laughs> we did some vampire characters on stage and eventually we made that, the movie. And, uh, yeah, and I, I have to thank that movie Nadia for starting that all off. And uh, yeah, so that character in the TV show is named after that film. It's, it's really weird because I have this like kind of superstition about songs that I don't know what they're about, but that I'll discover what they're about later. And there's always some kind of like weird synchronistic kind of chain of thoughts that leads me to discovering what it's about. And the song was kind of about this thing that's happened to me where I've been in love with a woman and then they've fallen in love with another woman. <laughs> and so mm. the song is kind of like, it's not about one incident. It's about the overlapping of this repeating thing that has happened to me. Multiple oh, that's times. happened more than once. Yeah. But it's really weird. Cause that movie. You're, you're attracted about, to gay women. I, I think so. But the thing is that Nadia, the movie it's about a couple, you know, it's like a guy and his wife gets seduced by the daughter of Dracula and he's trying to save or get his wife back from this like amazing supernatural woman or whatever. And I was like, this is, you know, it's just one of those things where you're just kind of like, oh my God, this is uh, really, really wild. So you didn't think about, you didn't think about the movie when you were writing the song, <laughs> didn't you? Well, I didn't know. I didn't know that movie. I hadn't seen it yet. Oh, you, wa you watched the movie after the song. Yeah, yeah. It's just one of those things where it's like the chain of events, the way that things happen, they've happened in the wrong order, but they make sense to me in some way. And that, that happens a lot with writing stuff, I think. Yeah. Well, Brett and I, when we write songs, we don't usually write like that because we have to know what it's about because the audience has to know what it's about straight away to laugh at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're not going for that reaction. When, when we first started writing songs, I remember Brett showing me a chord and going, hey, do you know this was a major seventh? Oh, cool. <laughs> and he's like, this sounds cool. like Serge Gainsbourg and then yeah, yeah. playing on the, and, and that and, and you, you know, using all the French phrases we had and then that's our French song that was our first song we wrote together Yeah, that's one thing I love about music is just a little you know, the tiniest thing can inspire a whole song one thing I'm fascinated with about comedy and one thing that I it won't leave me alone is like in music you can't bomb you can get booed off though you can music. get booed, you get, but, or you can also get, turn your amp up or you can turn right. it into a kind of like a chaotic kind of like meltdown. I don't know why I envy this. 
about comedians, but I envy the bomb because I feel like bombing is the seems to be the thing that kind of forges you into a great performer. There's no good comedian who's like, I've never bombed. It's like you bomb over and over again. And it also sounds like a nightmare, like a bad dream. It makes it a bit edgy. I got really used to being on stage where it didn't make me nervous at all and started to wonder if that was uh, going to be to my, you know, to my detriment. But when I act, you know, in movies on the first day or a TV show, I still get nervous. And, um, and I think perhaps that's a part, yeah, that, that's a part of uh, what keeps you awake, like your private jokes to yourself when you're playing. Did you, Yeah. This is, your, is this your first tour back since the pandemic? Yeah, we just did about a month of shows and we had to kind of relearn it. We have a new member in the band and my memory's not very good. Some musicians have great photographic memories and I, I don't really have that. But um, I'm really jealous of those people yeah. who can recall a song they haven't heard since 1984 and play it and remember the lyrics. And yeah, and I've, I've learned so many songs, you know, like I, I should, if I remembered every song I've ever learned, every like cover I've ever learned, I would know hundreds and hundreds, but I had barely know my own songs half the time. I think Brett and I both have that quality of not remembering other songs very well, and that's what pushed us into writing songs. <laughs> you know, we couldn't yeah. remember the songs. And that David Bowie song, we were trying to learn David Bowie songs. Oh, okay. And like, they're so complicated. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so like let's make up our own one and then we, you know, played it on <laughs> on stage. But that does writing it helps you remember it, right? Because you you have a different kind of memory, not just the sound, but where your hands are and um, you know, you do it over and over again trying to f- figure out the parts. How do you write a song? Do you have one approach that uh you usually take or does it differ? I don't know if you do this as well, but sometimes I start with the name of the song, like uh, I killed Captain Cook. The idea for the song actually started with the name because, uh, you know, from being in a punk band, I was thinking like that would be a really good punk song, you know, like by some Hawaiian hardcore band or something. Mm. So that's why it's, um, it's, uh sounds so different to what I thought it was going to sound like. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's so gentle and it is quite mournful, you know. Yeah, so I guess I was that was the next step was thinking it sounds like a punk like some punk song, like a Polynesian punk song. And so maybe I should make it, you know, more like really Hawaiian and have this kind of like a cool breeze kind of element to it. And then so mm. I started to kind of write write it using the like Hawaiian thing. If you think of a joke or you think of a, something funny for a song, you kind of like write that down and put it away for later. Do you ever do that or do you always write? Yeah, it? some songs took 20 minutes to write and some took years. Like I had another idea for that song from five years ago or 10 yeah. years ago. One time we had a show coming up and we had to write some new songs for it. And we just wrote a list of like 15 song titles. And then we asked our friends and flatmates, uh, just tick the ones you want to hear. <laughs> we hadn't written them. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I want to hear uh, something special for all the ladies in the world. I want to hear that. <laughs> so I guess yeah. we're going to write that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, uh, cool. We have done that as a technique. And sometimes it starts with, off with an idea for a story. Yeah. I, I guess, you know, you've done that as well. A lot of your songs are personal to you. And then some are, um, is it unusual for you to think of yourself as a character or a, another person? I've only done like one song where I wasn't, I was talking to Jake, uh, the bass player in my band. He works with this guy, um, Alex G. And he said that Alex is like really, like reads a lot and kind of reads a bunch of books. I know some of those people. Yeah. And they're like, I I don't read that much. I used to when I was a kid, but, and then, um, but they, but like a lot of nonfiction, especially, I mean, a lot of fiction, sorry, which is really what I don't read anymore i don't read enough fiction no i know what you mean because it's it's, you know it takes effort to get through a book and when you're reading a fiction book sometimes i think oh this isn't even true (laughs) (laughs) it's it seems silly why am i learning this about this life that didn't happen yeah this guy's just making this up isn't he like and then um yeah so he so i think alex's way of writing is that he would kind of imagine himself as these characters and kind of like go through the the song like that and i thought that's a really good idea because then you don't have to screw your life up to make songs and then mm. and i was thinking like that's another thing that's really dumb about me or one thing that i'm kind of stuck with is i can't um reinterpret myself as a character you've done it in that captain cook song 
you imagining uh... oh yeah 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 in the new album i have like layla as well because i was kind of i think i was thinking about my mum and my uncle and kind of trying to imagine myself through them so i'm like slowly getting more sophisticated as a writer but like i thought for a long time that I, what i have to do is i have to go out into the world have a bunch of adventures that screw m- up my emotional well-being and then with all of that noise in my head then i would just kind of have to be dumping it into songs and that would be the, then that used to be the only way that i could write the songs and i and, um yeah yeah and that presents a risk as a comedian and as a songwriter was, what if i become happy and successful yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to ruin everything. That's really t- um, terrifying because I don't even want to become less dysfunctional, you know, like <laughs> just because it's so. Fruitful. You want to keep the amount you have. Yeah, without without hurting people. Like it's like it's yeah. obviously like I want to become less of a dick like every day, but um, at the same time, I don't. Sometimes I think like, well, I don't really want to like wipe out my depression. It happens a lot with comedians, though. I mean, or it seems to we. They get to a certain point and then they start doing these like huge vehicles. And then you're like, I don't even find this funny. You know, Steve Martin used to be hilarious. And now he's like making these movies for everyone else. He's, he's not even sad anymore. Like, or like, you know, you kind of get this idea that they've become like well adjusted. And then, and you're like, oh, well, I'm happy for you. But you know, your, all your screwed up stuff was, was the stuff that really spoke to him. Right. You don't relate to it anymore. Uh, yeah. Well, I think I'm more, wor- not more worried about that as a fan. I'm more worried about that as like make it when I'm making stuff that I think like, well, I don't want to lose my edge or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, on this album, there's some, there's at least one instrument mental track, right? Oh uh, yeah. There's, I think there's a few, I mean, there's kind of like a few kind of half instrumental ones. There's one that reminded me, it made me think it was a, um, Felt like a sand, soundtrack about a story about a sad, funky ghost. That's what I thought when I heard <laughs> yeah, that movie. I want to. I see? think I have a few songs about sad, funky ghosts. Kind of. Yeah. I think that's what I, I think. That's kind of like what I want to become one day. <laughs> Rather than go to like heaven or hell, it would be funny to be like a sad, funky wandering. Ghost. Yeah, wandering sad, funky Grooving. ghost. I was, I was wondering who listened to your Grooving. music. You know, like it, it's. <laughs> A lot of it, most of it's danceable, but in quite a quite a reserved way, like where you just yeah. want to move your hips. Yeah, and, yeah. And I was wondering what your audience looks like. I've never um, seen you live. How do people dance? I can't show people on the podcast. I imagine that's like this, like they with the hand over their belly. And there's a bit of that. They're like they're quite nice people. Like I kind of feel like I cull the fan base quite a bit. Like I try to chase off. Like if I feel, I always feel like if there's an element of like a type of guy that's getting into the band for whatever reason, then I'll try to do a bunch of stuff to chase them away. Are you talking about when you become popular, your audience changes? And, yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or are you talking about a specific person that you'll see in the show <laughs> being annoyed? Well, it's like maybe I'll f- see a person. I think I don't want to see this guy ever again or whatever. And then I really feel like I spend probably more time i mean apart from in the time that i'm like obviously going out and performing and writing and trying to make this thing like what i think is really good as far as marketing is concerned i spend probably way more of my time trying to lose like try to cull the audience (laughs) you know what i mean yeah your record company is not going to like that hearing that (laughs) but the um i know what you mean i doing live shows sometimes there'll be you know you can see a thousand happy faces and you'll see one guy who's hating it yeah and for some reason i have often gone i'm going to concentrate on that guy i'm going to make it so <laughs> fucking whimsical i'm going to be so gentle now he's going to really hate this <laughs> this is going to be the gentlest comedy you've ever fucking seen but sometimes i wonder if it's just his face because i've heard that you know in shows that i've gone to see which i've enjoyed perfectly and then people go i heard you went to that show and you hated it the whole time it's like oh no it's my it's just the shape of my mouth on the new tour it was like trying to deal with all the new characteristics of gen z people who are 20 they've never been to a show yeah because they haven't been able to go to shows for the last four years just the way we haven't been able to play them and they're all kind of amazed i went to a concert a long long ago a couple of months ago and they're like, that's mind blowing. It's extra exciting for them, but it's really nice to see it as well. Feel sorry for them. The new audience, they're really like wild, but really like chill. <laughs> like, there would be people just like 
I was just kind of like, are those people having sex like in the middle of the dance floor? Your music's a bit like that. Like, you get those people. Yeah, I mean, that's what I want. I don't want to be misunderstood because and get people who aren't like that, I suppose. Yeah. Because it's not like, because my old band, we had a punk band, me and me and Cody had a punk band called The Mint Chicks, and there was a lot of kind yeah, of... Yeah, I remember you guys, I remember your posters around, uh, it's crazy, yes, dumb, no. <laughs> yeah, I was really <laughs> attracted by that imagery, the exclamation marks. It's really bold. And yeah, I remember you being one of the New Zealand acts that we were around at the same time we were starting to play in America or, you know, starting to tour in America. Yeah, there was some anger in the music. Like it was kind of like maybe for me, it wasn't like necessarily anger, but it's just like, you know, kind of like young, um, sexually frustrated men music. And what do you say this? Do you think this is more sexually satisfied music? <laughs> it's definitely got a sexual element. The, the no, anger that's, in, the, that's there's one still thing. anger in your music, though, but it's in the lyrics. It's not in the sound. No, it's, it's sad. It's not angry. I'm interested by the song The Garden, which is the yeah. one that's been in my head. What's that one about? I don't know because that's, you know, like I have to. You're waiting to find out what it's about. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I know kind of partly what it's about. It's kind of about just another breakup kind of song but i still am slowly piecing together what the garden is or whatever and i think when i first started thinking about it i think it was just a way of trying to explain just how screwed up everything felt like how nothing kind of feels right anymore or like and maybe the right. garden is like the garden of eden or, or just kind of the earth because you're, you're talking about violence yeah after dark in the garden the garden's a, a perfect place but there's something that you you don't see in it at first yeah yeah and it's just kind of like gone sour i don't, I don't really know exactly because often i'll write these lyrics and then i'll think that's a good line I like, well, not a good line, but I might think, okay, that's good. That's that's going in the song. I like, you like it. it. I know what you mean. You're a New Zealander. You're not allowed to say that. Yeah. You feel like, yeah, that's a real point of difference in America where people say, I wrote this. It was great. And you, uh, you get used to it. Oh, yeah, you know, that's okay. They, they are allowed to say that. And that's what they've been taught to say. <laughs> We've been taught to say. Yeah. I think, you know, we always use I think. Yeah. Well, do you reckon? Do you reckon? Uh... Where, where they just say the statement. <laughs> yeah. So I just think. Oh, that, that line's going in a song. That that line works, and then I'll think, oh, it's such a surreal, whimsical, psychedelic, you know, nonsense thing that sounds cool and has some mysterious, high-minded meaning. And then later, I'll realize like it was really just really explicit. If that makes sense, like I'll just be like, oh, I was just confessing what I actually think. And now I'm kind of worried about the garden. So I was like, is somebody going to get <laughs> knocked in the head in the gut? And am I going to die in the garden or something? And then because everything happens out of order. And I like I didn't go from watching uh, what we do in the shadows to watching Nadja to writing the song. Mm. Um, I watched Nadja like this weekend just gone in preparation to talk to you. And it's like, oh, this is, this is the way these things fit together. It's like they do make sense, but it's like, but how that would doesn't make sense coming from comedy i find it quite exciting about um music <laughs> and drama and stuff that people don't always know what it's about um or they figure it out later and i like that I, you don't do that in comedy you know usually some people do but um usually you're trying to you, you want people to relate as soon as they can i used to go and see these these people's plays and there was always a big discussion about what the scene meant and and then i yeah. was in one of their plays and then i asked you know well, what does the scene mean and he's like the director's like oh, i don't know yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah 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 i like that even more than having an answer you know this interpretation and it's left up to the audience or or the artists themselves at a different time but that but then that's where the bullshit can creep in too, you know. So it's like you have yep. to be vigilant because like the thing that's cool about comedy is, is if nobody's laughing, it's not good. And when you're first working on something new, you can change it, you know. The next time you do it, it will be different. Yeah. Like that line didn't work, change that right. line. And then music's music, you don't get that kind of reaction very much unless you say you know like you want people to dance and you can you can go let's play it a bit faster a bit slower yeah 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 let's take out the bit. we have this thing where we like have some carny language that we use i don't want to get too far away from that feeling of like that you're traveling carnival or something you know that you're actually there to um give people entertainment or whatever and and uh i have a friend that i've known from high school he's really obsessed with wrestling and we got 
like certain language and well the one that we always use is um in wrestling they say you get a pop <laughs> so we talk about that all the time and a pop is just when the audience goes Whoa! you know at some uh yeah yeah thing and christian our new keyboard player is, he's a teacher at, at berkeley and it's like a, a a proper musician like a <laughs> proper jazz musician and stuff and there's this kind of like pressure to not give in to the most carny aspects of it because we don't want to lose his respect <laughs> You know, right, and get right. too rock and roll and too um, spinal tap to the point where we're just kind of doing the same tricks every night to get the same pops, <laughs> you know. And so the the whole thing is like just turning that into something a bit more esoteric, where it's like trying to figure out, it's like how can you make the audience get a wow out of the audience doing something that you've never done before, or trying to figure out something that's gonna make you go, wow, oh, they, why did everybody respond to that one thing? And it's like, I feel like that's the closest thing to, you know, like a laugh that we can get. I notice with us when we play, often it's the first time where you haven't even finished writing it, but there's some excitement that you have, which you know is the, uh, the uh, nervousness, like, how's it going to go? We've got to get through this song. And <laughs> there's all these parts to it, and we don't quite know how to play it yet. Yeah. And um, sometimes it gets this real reaction that you know you're never going to see again. Yeah. Well, we have this song. It's from the TV show, it's, and and it's uh, from Flight of the Conquest TV show, and it's um, called Jermaine, You Don't Have to Be a Prostitute. And it's partly based on Roxanne by Sting. Yeah. And we used to play it sometimes on tour, not there that often. And, and sometimes we'd go into Roxanne at the end and we'd say, yeah. Jermaine. You know, yeah. that would be. Yeah. <laughs> and but one time Sting came to the show and so we're like, we've got to do that song. And like, we haven't done it for <laughs> done that song for three years. And I think, you know, our nervousness of playing his song yeah. to him just made it go off in a way that it, it never, ever had before. My friend was asking me, do you get nervous before you go on stage? And I was like, oh, it's such a complicated question because it's like, of course you do. But sometimes you kind of think, oh, yeah, it's like that thing of like, it gets it can get really um, weird because sometimes you like, it might be like, oh, I, I was standing next to that guy who was smoking a joint and then I had two shots of tequila and then I, you know, took a quick shit. And then, and then you think I have to do that every single show. You kind of like get this thing. Where You've got to like, time your meals to get that shit on time. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, I've got to pretend that Sting is in the audience. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so he's doing all these things. I've got to get him in the audience. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, make Sting show up for every show or whatever. <laughs> One thing you can't get is the audience has a different chemistry of its own. Yeah. And I didn't really realize that until I did some movies and watched the movies again with different audiences. And this audience loves this joke. Or well, this audience loves this movie. This audience is quiet on it. I was like, oh, wow. It's actually the different combination of this group of people that has its own uh, life and, and you can't control that. I suppose the thing that's good about the live show is you sort of can put your antenna out and try and figure out like what what do these people want? you know, today, what are they, how are they feeling? Cause you can't do the big spectacular show. If everybody's kind of like getting, uh, if, if everybody's in groovy ghost mode, then they might not want like <laughs> to build kiss, up, to you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Being your first tour back, were you nervous the first time standing on stage after a long time? Uh, yeah. Cause I, I've very rarely been on stage sober in a, in a long time. I drink less now, but it's just the idea of not being at least taking a little bit of a liquid courage yeah. before going out is still really hard for me because I got when I go to shows, I look at performers and I think that's impossible, you know, because from the audience, when you're in the dark and you're looking at the pe person on stage and then they have the lights on them, you think, I do that. That's insane yeah because it's so nice to be in the audience and enjoy the show in the shadows just kind of you don't have to do anything but kind of enjoy the show and and then you think oh my god how do, how am i going to get in front of those people and i haven't really quite figured out how to do it without without kind of dumbing myself down a bit but i'm kind of like incorporating sober gigs <laughs> and slowly but i always find myself like thinking about stuff like i get i say the a line and often when I'm doing a song, I'll think about the thing that the song is about and, I, and I'll get quite caught up in the emotions of it. But when I'm sober and I do that, I get in my head too much. And then the next thing I'm like forgotten, I'm on stage and I'll make a little like mistake or right. something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of people have a persona, even if they don't let the audience know there is one, you know, like Prince had his different 
personas that he thought of himself Beyonce and uh, yeah. definitely Brett and I do have these personas which are based loosely on ourselves. I re- only remember one time where it was hard to do. We were in this tiny gig where it was basically like a box where 10 people can fit. It was was an Edinburgh Festival thing and they're so close to you and you know they can tell you're not really that person. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that's interesting yeah yeah it, it's it was harder than playing a big gig yeah when they're th- that close to you you're like oh they know that we, they know no, we're not quite like this because they can see it in our eyes so i guess we should wrap up soon but i find one interesting thing about you know i've been in tonga recently uh working with a friend of mine who's someone and we keep comparing the different polynesian cultures and and you know words always excited oh they call it a feke too <laughs> you know, yeah that's octopus for the, for the listener <laughs> the things like that but then one thing that's really different is the music so the yeah. music in cook islands is is like um you know really rhythmic exciting yeah. drums and the music in hawaiians quite you know it's like a hawaiian breeze i suppose and then the maori music is very sad you know yeah. and a lot of flutes yeah maori Ma- maori are like the goths of the polynesian realm <laughs> <laughs> i think that's like um to me is the biggest reminder that the cultures are different, although they're very closely related. Yeah. Do, where do you think that comes from? Why is the New Zealand? Why are we the Goths? The first thing that would come to my mind is the weather. Yeah, well, the Goths, the the, the music group, the Goths, <laughs> is you know from England, which is the yeah. is cold as well. <laughs> so it's interesting how a landscape can inform a culture, and you know, it, art, you know. Art, visual art from the South Island is different from visual art in the North Island. And, you know, I have to explain something. I haven't had much breakfast and the microphone is right near my stomach. So you might have heard these noises and I have to admit it's me. It's not Ruben. <laughs> it's not part of our, our accent. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of gurgle when they talk. Yeah, there's a rumbling sound. Okay, well, that was our podcast. Cool. <laughs> I don't know what we talked about, but I got... Okay, I think I I think I asked you all the questions that I wanted to ask you. That I had uh, yeah, in my yeah, head. yeah. I, I yeah, I don't want to nerd on about you know music stuff too much, but I do want to learn about it at the same time. Yeah, cool. All right, cool, sweet. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for um, letting me talk to Jermaine. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast, and thanks to Jermaine Clement and Ruben Nielsen for chatting. If you like what you heard, please follow Talk House on your favorite podcasting platform, and be sure to check out all the goodies at TalkHouse.com. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan, and the Talk House theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.